Okay, so welcome to this next video in which I am explaining to you how the botulinum neurotoxins work. So we have discussed uh, the mechanism by which we dock vesicles at the membrane of um, a presynaptic neuron, and it's through the formation of these trans coarse snare complexes which anchor these synaptic vesicles at the plasma membrane. Okay, so what we now want to discuss is, uh, finally, therefore, how do we actually uh, fuse these vesicles with the membrane? Well, I've said all we need to do is remove this complexin protein here. So, what happens is when an action potential propagates along here, it depolarizes the membrane, okay? And what that's going to do is it's going to open voltage-gated calcium channels in the membrane of the axon terminal. So, let's draw a voltage-gated calcium channel up here. Okay, so voltage-gated calcium channels are made up of a main subunit known as the alpha-1 subunit. So this, which I've drawn so far, is the alpha-1 subunit of a voltage-gated calcium channel. Now, the alpha-1 subunit is the main subunit because it's the subunit that actually has the pore which allows calcium to move through it. Okay, now there are many different genes which code for alpha-1 subunits. Uh, I think there are in fact 10 genes, and um, only two of them are found in axon termini. And basically these two genes that are used to code for alpha-1 subunits in axon uh, terminals uh, are the CAV2.1 gene and the CAV2.2 gene. Now, if you use the CAV2.1 gene uh, to uh, make your alpha-1 subunit, then you are then known as a PQ-type voltage-gated calcium channel. And if you use the CAV2.2, you are known as an N-type. So basically, you only have PQ-type or N-type voltage-gated calcium channels in the axon terminals of neurons. Okay, now, voltage-gated calcium channels consist of more than just this alpha-1 subunit. They also have a bunch of accessory subunits, which I will draw like so. Okay, so that's my attempt at a picture of a voltage-gated calcium channel. Now, this subunit here, this accessory subunit here, is the gamma subunit, so I'll draw it in a different colour. So, gamma is in orange, okay, beta will have in purple, so beta is this subunit here, and it's, it's bound to the link between the first and the second domains of the alpha-1 subunit. Okay, so here's the beta subunit, so it's bound on the intracellular aspect of the alpha-1 subunit. And uh, then finally, in pink over here, we'll have the alpha-2 delta subunit. Okay, so this is alpha-2 delta. This box bit up here denotes the alpha-2 subunit, and the delta bit is this line that's implanting it into the membrane. Okay, right, so these voltage-gated calcium channels, which are often abbreviated to VGCCs for voltage-gated calcium channels, uh, they're going to open when action potentials come along and reach this action, uh, axon terminal. That's going to allow calcium to move into the cell, okay? Now, the alpha-2 delta subunit in particular is involved in making sure that these voltage-gated calcium channels are very closely positioned by these uh, docked synaptic vesicles, so that when these voltage-gated calcium channels of the N or PQ type open, they're going to spray the calcium onto the machinery of the synaptic vesicles, basically. Now, there is, in the membrane of the synaptic vesicles, a protein capable of sensing calcium. Okay, so let me draw this protein. Where shall I put it? I'll have to put it here because I've written synaptobrevin where I would have liked to put it. So, we'll put this protein here. It's often drawn like so. Okay, so I'll do it in... what colour shall I have this in? I'll have it in purple. Okay, so this sort of structure that I've drawn here is what is known as synaptotagmin, what's supposed to represent a protein that's called synaptotagmin. So let me put its name down here, nice and big. So this is synapto, maybe that's a little bit too big, tagmin. Okay, so one word, but I couldn't fit it all in. Synaptotagmin. And basically, when calcium goes up in the vicinity of synaptotagmin, calcium is going to bind to the synaptotagmin, okay? 
and what is going to happen, or what's believed potentially as far as the clamp theory is concerned to happen, is that synaptotadmin is going to move the complexin protein out of the way, and that's going to allow these core snare complexes to roll up and bundle up even more, pulling uh, the um, vesicle membrane closer to the plasma membrane, and then they'll fuse. So that's believed to be how uh, you fuse the two membranes in response to calcium, and therefore how you release this, um, well, the neurotransmitter from the vesicles into the synaptic cleft. So, what was the point of this entire discussion? The point of this discussion was to tell you how important these snare complexes are in, um, in the um, release of neurotransmitter from axon terminals, because this, this machinery is going to be what we target with botulinum neurotoxins. Okay, so now we've discussed that machinery. Let's discuss for a little while uh, the bacterium Clostridium botulinum. Okay, so it is or a clostridial species of bacterium. So I'll write out its name in full. So it's Clostridium botulinum. Now, clostridial species, they like to live in anaerobic conditions. They don't like oxygen. Okay, and Clostridium botulinum, the place that you can actually sort of catch Clostridium botulinum from is generally badly stored uh, preserved food, basically. So uh, if you try and make... Uh, people used to make their own sausages, for instance, and they didn't do it properly, they didn't put the right amounts of preservatives in, and this bacterium was then capable of growing in uh, these sausages and would produce botulinum neurotoxin, and then when they ate the sausages, even though the Clostridium botulinum might not actually still be alive in the sausage, the neurotoxin is still there, and if you ingest the neurotoxin, it can then lead to flaccid paralysis of your neurons by um, attacking these snare proteins, as we'll see. Okay, so this is one of the arguments that you can give to people when they tell you about how awful, um, awful the modern food industry is and how awful preservatives are and how bad they are for you. Well, <laughs> the alternative is Clostridium botulinum growing in the food. So, <clears throat> uh, so yes, uh, that's where Clostridium botulinum is famous the um, encountered in homemade sausage. <laughs> okay, so Clostridium botulinum, it's an anaerobic bacterium, so I'll put that in. It's anaerobic, it grows in conditions uh, where you don't have oxygen. And in fact, all Clostridium species are anaerobic. It's also gram-positive, gram-positive, which means that if you gram-stain it, it looks blue down the microscope. It means, in more real terms, uh, that it doesn't have a second cell membrane. It only has one cell membrane, and then it has a thick cell wall around that cell membrane. So I'll draw it here. Okay, so this blue mass that I'm drawing around the cell membrane is supposed to represent its thick cell wall. So it has a thick cell wall and only one cell membrane. So this represents our Clostridium botulinum bacterium here. Okay, so... What it's going to do is it's going to produce its botulinum toxin. So here it produces botulinum toxin. And botulinum toxin is often abbreviated to B-O-N-T for short. That's the, that's how, um, that's the sort of medical way of abbreviating it. Um, the sort of, um, the um, popular way of abbreviating it is Botox, botulinum toxin. But this is the medical way of abbreviating it, botulinum neurotoxin in now. Okay, uh, so B-O-N-T. Right, uh, so what's the structure of botulinum neurotoxin? Well, we're not going to do it in too much detail, but the main thing to understand is that it has two chains, okay? It has a heavy chain, and it has a light chain. So this here is its heavy chain, the bigger one, heavy chain, okay? And this here is supposed to represent the light chain of our botulinum neurotoxin. Okay, so let me colour each of those chains in. So we'll have the heavy chain in red here. Okay, and then we'll have the light chain in um, green, I think. Right, so, now, let's say we have eaten some dodgy sausage, 
and we've got uh, this botulinum neurotoxin within our bollard now. What's going to happen? Well, it's going to get to neurons. It's going to get to the axon terminals of neurons, and there is where it's going to bind and enter the axon terminal. Okay, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.